All right, Grahamlet 4.0, MVP, uh, Act uh, 2, Scene 2. Nothing in my ear. Nothing in this ear. 97.5% memorized. No text on the screen. No text up here. For me to look at. Let's go. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstone. Moreover, there be much to long to see you. The need we have to use you to provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? So I call it, sit more the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was. What it should be, more than his father's death, that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both, that being of so young days brought up with him, and sith so neighbour to his youth and humour, that you vouchsafe for your rest here at our court some little time. So, by your uh, companies, to draw him under pleasures, and to gather, so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that open lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, we have much talked of you, and should I am there is too many, and should I am too men there is not living to whom you want it hears, if it will please you to show so much gentry and good will as to expend your time with us so while, for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might by the sovereign power you have of us put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty, but we both obey, and here give of ourselves, in the, four, in the four bent, to lay our service freely at your feet, to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz, and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern, and gentle Rosencrantz. And I beseech you both instantly to, to, instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Hi, amen. The ambassadors from Norway, my lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. <laughs> Have I, my lord? I assure my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my god and to my gracious king. And I do think, or else this brain of mine haunts not the trail of policy, so sure that it is used to do, that I found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that, that do I long to hear. Give first thy minutes to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit of that great feast. Thyself do raise to them and bring them in. He tells me, my sweet queen, they have found the hidden source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the mean. His father's death and our all hasty marriage. Well, we shall sift them. Welcome, good friends. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voltimar, what from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. Upon our first, he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies, which to him appeared to be a preparation against the Polak, but better looked into. He truly found it was against your highness, where it grieved that so his sickness, age, and impotence was forced to, were forced to born in hand. Sends out arrests on Fort and Brass, which he, in brief, obeys. Receives rebuke from Norway, and then fine, makes vow before his uncle, never more to give the essay of arms against your majesty. Whereon, overcome with joy, or, uh, old Norwegian gives him 3,000 crowns in annual fee, and his commission to employ those soldiers, so levied as before, against the Polak, with an entreaty, here then further shown, that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for his enterprise, on such regards of safety and allowance as therein are set down. It likes us well, and in a more considered time we'll read, answer, and think upon this business. Meantime, thank you for your well, we thank you for your well-took labor. Go to your rest. At night we'll feast together. Most welcome home. This business is well ended. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why, day is day, night, night, and time is time, or nothing but the waste, night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad, call it, for to define true madness, what is to be nothing else but bad? <laughs> but let that go. More matter, with less art. Madam, I swear you use no art at all. That he's mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity. And pity, tis, tis true. A foolish figure, but farewell, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him then. And now remains that we find out the cause of this effect. Or rather say, the cause of this defect, for this effect effective comes by cause. But thus it remains, and the remainder thus. Papen. <clears throat> I have a daughter, have or she is mine, who in her duty and obedience, Ma, hath given me this. Now, gather and surmise. 
To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. It's a vile phrase. Vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase. But you shall hear. <clears throat> Thus. In her excellent white bosom, these. etc. came this from Hamlet to her. Good madam, stay a while, I will be faithful. <clears throat> doubt that the stars are fire, doubt that the, doubt that the sun doth. Doubt that the stars are fire, doubt that the earth the sun doth move, doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. O oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers, I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best, O oh, most best, believe it, adieu, thy nevermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, Hamlet, this to me, in obedience hath shown, hath, hath, in obedience hath she shown me, and more above hath her silver sittings, as they fell out by time, by means, and place, all given to mine ear. But how has she received this love? What do you think of me? As of a man faithful and honourable. I would fain prove so. But what might you think? When I had seen this hot love on the wing, as I perceived that I must tell you that before my daughter told me, what might you or my dear majesty your queen here think? If I played the desk or table book, or given my heart a winking mute and dumb, or looked upon this love with idle sight, what might you think? No. I went round to work. And my young mistress, thus I did bespeak, Lord Hamlet is a prince. Out of thy star, this must not be. And then I precepts gave her, that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens, which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repulsed, a short tale to make, fell into a sadness, then to a fast, then to a watch, then to a weakness, then to a lightness, and by this declension, into the madness, wherein now he raves and all we wail for. Do you think tis this? Very so. It, it may be like. It may, very like, it may be so. Had there been such a time, I would fain know that, that I positively said tis so when it proved otherwise? Not that I know. Take this from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstances lead me, I will find what truth is hid, or hidden deep within the center. How may we try it further? You know sometimes he walks four hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time, I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind the heiress, then. Mark the encounter. If he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for a state, but keep a farm and carters. We will try it. But look where short, but look where, but look where mm, the poor wretch, but look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, oh, away, I, I, I do beseech you both, away. Oh, I'll board him presently. Keep me here. <clears throat> How does my good lord Hamlet? <sighs> well, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent well. You are a fishmonger. Uh, not I, my lord. Hmm. Then would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord. Aye, sir. To be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. But if the sun bring maggots and a dead dog being a good kissing carrion. <laughs> have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Hmm. Better not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. <laughs> Friend, look to it. <laughs> How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter. Yet he knew me not at first. He said it was a fishmonger. He is far gone, far gone. And truly in my youth I suffered much extremity for love. Very near this. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What is the matter, my lord? Between whom? I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Slander, sir. For the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit, together with most weak hams, all which, sir, though I most powerfully and perfectly believe, yet I hold it not honestly to have it thus set down. For you yourself, sir, shall grow old as I am, if like a crab you could go backward. Though this be mannish, yet there is method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave. Indeed, that's out of the air. How pregnant sometimes the supplies are. The happiness that often madness sits on, which reason and sanity cannot so prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him, and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My, my, uh, my most honorable lord, I will, uh, my honorable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I would more willingly part with all, except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Fare well, my lord. These tedious old fools. You could see the Lord Hamlet, there he is. God save you, sir. My honored lord, my most dear lord, my 
Excellent, good friends. Ah, oh, Guildenstern, how dost thou, Rose and Krantz? Good lads out of you both. As the indifferent children of the earth, happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap we are not the very button, nor the source of a shoe, neither, my lord. But then leave about a waist in the middle of our favours. <laughs> Faith, our private sweet. Oh, in the secret parts of fortune, oh, most true, she is a strumpet. What news? None, my lord, but the world's grown honest. Hmm. And it's doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question you more in particular. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord. One marks a prison. Then is the world one. A goodly one. Which are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why then, tis none to you. For there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, God. I could be bound in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams, indeed, are ambition. For the very substance of the ambition is merely the shadow of a dream. Shadow itself is but a dream. Truly, and I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's dream. Then are our beggars' bodies and our monarchs and outstretched hitters the beggars' shadows? <laughs> Shall we to the court for by my fear? I cannot reason. We'll wait upon you. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants, for to speak to you like an honest man I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you with else in all? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Hmm. Beggar that I am, I am even poor and thanks, but I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear a halfpenny. We're not sent for. Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, come, dear, just leave with me. Come, come. Nay, speak. <laughs> what should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose. You were sent for. And there's a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to colour. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? That you must teach me. Well, let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the constancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear a better proposal could charge you with all, be even and direct with me whether you were sent for or no. What say you? Nay, then I have an idea. If you love me, hold not off. Ah, my lord... We were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen molt no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercise, and indeed it goes so heavily with my dis with this disposition that, that with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire. It appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. No, no woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. My lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then when I said man delights not me? And to think, my lord, if you delight not in man, but lend an entertainment the players shall receive from you. We quoted them on the way, and hither are they coming to offer you service. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh gratis. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are taken with the seer, and the lady shall speak her mind and over and the lady shall speak her mind freely of the blank verse shall hot for it. What players are they? Even those who own to take such delight in the tragedians of the city. How chances that they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. I think the inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. Uh, how comes it? Do they go rusty? Nay. That endeavour keeps in the wonted pace. But there is, sir, an eerie of children, little asses that cry out on top of question and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion. 
And so we rattle the common stages, so they call them, that the many wedding rapiers are afraid of goose squills and dare scarce come to them. <laughs> it's possible? Wait, what, are they children? How are they maintained? Wait, who maintains them? What, are they children? Who maintains them? How are they escorted? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? Will they not say afterwards if their uh, if their means are no better? If they will they not say afterwards? Should they grow themselves to common players, as it is most like if their means are not better? Their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession. <laughs> faith, there's been much to do on both sides, and uh, and the and faith, faith, there's been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds it no sin to tar them to controversy. There was for a while no money bid for argument, unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in the question. It's possible. <laughs> oh, there's been much throwing about with brains. Do the boys carry away? Aye, that they do, my lord. Hercules in his load, too. Hmm. It's not very strange. For my uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mouths at him while my father lived give twenty, forty, fifty, and a hundred ducats apiece for his picture in little. Splat. There is something in this more than natural, if philosophy could find it out. There are the players. Gentlemen. You are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come. The pertinence of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my appearance to the players, which I tell you must show fairly outward, should more appear like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. But my uncle, father, and aunt, mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north-northwest. And I'm in a southerly. I know a hawk from a hand song. Well, be with you, gentlemen. Hawk, you... Gilderstone, and you too, and each year they hit her. <laughs> that great baby you see there is not yet out of the swaddling clouds. <laughs> happily is the second time come to them. Happily is the second time come to, the, come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. I will prophesy he comes to tell me the players, Mark. Oh, you say right, sir. Monday morning comes indeed. Uh, 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 my, my lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Roscius was an actor in Rome, the actors have come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon my honor, then came each actor on his ass. <laughs> The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, uh, uh, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical historical pastoral, scene individual or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy nor Plotus too light. For the law of the writ and the liberty, these are the only men. Oh, Jephthah, judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou. What a treasure had he, my lord. Why? One fair doctor and no more, the witchy love it passing well? Still on my daughter. Am I not in the way, little Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows then? Why? As by law. No, uh, why? As by. Uh, God, by, God, by law, God, what? You know, and then. The most like is it. Well, fuck, yeah, wait. What? What follows then? Why? As by law, God, what? And you know. It came to pass most like as it was, or something like that. Um, the first row of the pious chanson will show you more, for look where my abridgment comes. You are welcome, masters. Welcome all. Uh, uh, my, uh, um, very glad to see thee. Welcome, my good friends. Ah, my old friend. Thy face is valent since I saw thee last. Uh, comes thou to beard me in Denmark? Well, my young lady and mistress, by a lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last by the attitude of a shopping. Pray God your voice like a piece of uncut and gold be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you are all welcome. We'll lean into it like French falconers. Fly at anything we see. Come. Uh, let's have a speech. I mean, uh, come on, let's be, come, I mean, uh, we'll have us a speech straight. Come, give us a taste. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my good lord? I heard thee speak me speech once, but it was never acted, or if it was, not above once. For the play I remember pleased not the million, it was caviar to the general, but it was as I received it, and others, and, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine, an excellent play, well digested in the scene, set down with as much modesty as cunning. Once said there were, I remember once that there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savory, no, no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly loved was Aeneas' tale to Dido, and that about of it especially where she he speaks of prime slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line. Let me see. Let me see. The rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast. No, it is not so. It begins with Pyrrhus. Uh, the rugged Pyrrhus, 
he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble, when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Head to foot now is he total ghouls, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets that lend a tyrannous and damned light to their lords, their vile murders, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus all sized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam, seeks. <laughs> so I proceed you. Oh God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. Anon, he finds him, striking too short of Greeks. His antique sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched, Pyrrhus at Priam, uh, Pyrrhus at, uh, drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then, senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow, with flaming top, stooped to his base, and with a hideous crash, takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the head of milk, the, uh, which was declining on the milky head of Reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. And, as a painted, so, as a painted tyrant, Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But, as we all see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold winds speechless, and the orb below is hush as death. Anon, the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So, after Pyrrhus' pause, aroused vengeance sets some newer work, and never did the Cyclops' hammers fall. On Mars his armor forged for proof he turn, with less remorse than Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou stupid fortune! All you gods and general sinner, take away her power! Break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven, as low as to the fiends. This is too long. The child of the barbers with your beard, pretty Seon. He's for a jig or a tail of Bodger who he sleeps. Seon, come to Hecuba. But who, ah, oh, woe, had seen the Moblet Queen. The Moblet Queen. Moblet Queen, that's good. The Moblet Queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with piss and room. A clout upon that head, where late the diadem stood, and for a robe about her lank and all all timid loins, a blanket in the alarm of fear caught up. Who this had seen, with tongue and venom steeped, against fortune's state would treason have pronounced. But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamour that she made, unless things mortal moved them, not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion the gods. Prithee, no more. I mean, uh, mm, da, da, da. look you where he has not turned his colour and his tears in his eyes. Look where he has not turned his colour and has tears in his eyes. Prithee, no more. Tis well. I'll have thee speak at the rest soon. Good, my lord. Will you see the players uh, well bestowed? I mean, do you hear? Let them be well used. For they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. After your death, you will better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. I will use them according to their desserts, sir. God's bodykin, man. God's bodykins, man, much better. Use every man after his dessert and you shall escape whipping. Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. That's a him, old friend. Can you play the murder of Gonzago? Aye, my lord. We'll have tomorrow night. You could for a need study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines which I would sit down in a certain could you not? Aye, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord, and look you, mock him not. My good friends, I'll leave you till night. For my lord. Aye, so, probably will you. Now I am alone. It's the very witching time of night, when churchyards yawn. And hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Soft. Now, is it? 
Uh, well, I might be getting confused here. Um, so, now, now to my mother. Is this, I think this is the part. Now to my mother. Um, o oh heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cool, but not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. How in my words so much she be sent to give them seals. Never my soul consent. And I'll just make sure. Making sure of the things that do the things. Oh god, no. I'm way fucked up. I thought I was fucking it up. I'm gonna have to edit this. Oh, what? Okay, right. Had the players doing. Barbers uh huh, uh huh. We always stood our butt against. Uh huh. Oh, fuck, no. God damn it. Sorry. Sorry again. Now I'm alone. I so got to be. Now I'm alone. Okay. Right. Right. Now I'm alone. Now I so got to be with you. Now I'm alone. Oh, what a roguing peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul, soul to his whole conceit, that from her working all his visage won, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole, his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hakiba. <laughs> What's hacky better him? I need a hacky that he should weep for her. What would he do had he the motive in the cue for passion that I have? <laughs> he would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with hearted speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculty of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy meddled rascal, peak like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause and can say nothing. Not for a king upon whose property and most Dear life, a damned defeat was made. Who calls me coward? Am I a villain? Who calls me? Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this, huh? Swans, I should take it. But it cannot be that I am pigeon livered and lack gold to make oppression bitter, that ere this I would have feathered all the region kites with this slave's offal. Bloody, bawdy villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance! <laughs> Why, what an ass am I? Mm, I sure, this is most brave. That I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted in my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and follow cursing like a very drab, a scullion, fire upon it. About my brain. Hmm. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have, by the very cunning of the scene, been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, that would have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before my uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tempt him to the quick. If he would blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing, and then I'll catch the conscience of the king. <laughs> <laughs>